coming yeah. in January. Yeah. 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 Just call it yeah. into order for uh, Monday, April the 8th. I have an amendment to the agenda to start with, please. Uh, number Item number 13. Please eliminate it from the agenda for tonight. We will not be going to close meeting. I'm looking for approval of the amended agenda. Move, second. All those in favor? All those carried? Isn't he? Adoption of the minutes of the regular council meeting held March the 25th be adopted as presented. Moved, second. Any errors or omissions? All those in favor? All those carried. That the record of the public hearing held March the 25th, 2019, be received. Be received. Second. Thank you. All those in favor? Opposed? And carried. We have one delegation tonight. That's one of I always like to hear from. That's our RCMP partners in the community. Uh, we have our Staff Sergeant Detachment Staff Sergeant Carl Redner here tonight. We also have Superintendent Brian Massey. So the floor is yours, gentlemen, whoever's speaking. Or... Well, thank you, Mayor. Uh, thanks to Mayor and Council for the invitation yet again, and to all the guests. I'm used to a little bit more people in the audience tonight, so I was told that it's a budget night, and that may have had an influence on the amount of people, but thank you for those that came out uh, for this. Uh, as you had mentioned, Karen, thank you very much. Uh, Superintendent Brian Massey is here. He is in charge of the Upper Fraser Valley Regional Detachment, the area that encompasses Agassiz, uh, Chilliwack, Hope, and Boston Bar, so a, a pretty wide area. Uh, and what I'll be speaking about tonight, and I don't mean to turn my back on anybody, I'll keep moving around, uh, is uh, our strategic plan. It's a wrap up of what we went to the community about and to the elected representatives for the communities. We had uh, direct meetings with individuals. We also had an online survey and through that Part of that process, we got together after the fact to collate the data that was collected from the general public to put together the strategic plan for the Upper Fraser Valley Regional Detachment for the entire area. There are going to be unique things, and I may have mentioned that during our meeting that we had here, that is going to be strictly or going to be for hope specific. That never changes. Obviously, we're always amenable. Things are always uh, can be changed or amended to fit our local priorities, but this is the, our guiding principles for the next three years. Uh, we did this exercise back in 2015. Some of you may have been around for the origination of that one. That was prior to my time, but I, I when I came on, it became part of uh, my operating agenda for uh, within the Upper Fraser Valley Regional Detachment. So uh, I'm sure most of you know, uh, I've been here for three and a half years now. I stopped hearing the question as to whether I was going to leave or not, so I thank you for stopping that. Uh, I am here, I'm not going anywhere, and as far as I know, uh, the superintendent hasn't asked me to leave as of yet, and neither has mayor or council. So thank you for that vote of confidence at this point in time. So our strategic plan came to an end in 2018. So we needed to uh, go about the process again of developing the strategic plan. So. It, as it indicates there, it's going to guide our detachment operations until 2021. Uh, we want, obviously, to have measurable outcomes uh, so that the public, uh, elected representatives, could have something concrete to look at to see. Are we moving forward? Are we developing? Are we doing what it is that we need to do? And that's what, and what was being asked of us to, or what's being asked of us to do. Uh, we obviously use uh, crime data. We're an intelligence-developed uh, uh, organization at this point in time. We looked at the demographic. We looked at the whole scope of things within the UFDRD, and then, of course, hope falling within that. Again, we did consultation. We did consultation with uh, specific groups, specific people, specific agencies. And we also uh, sought out people to respond to an online survey. So those even that were part of a community consultation where we were direct and sat down across in a room with them, uh, we also invited people to go and do an online survey. So from that, we've developed uh, a, a plethora of information. 
And from that, we were able to determine very distinct uh, ideas and issues that the public had identified. And it was common throughout all the areas within the UFERD. It wasn't unique to Chilliwack, and I know that, that Chilliwack is the big brother within the UFERD, but when we were able to, we, and of course we could, split out the data in between all the different uh, CPOs or community police offices and the different areas, we identified that the thought processes and the wants and desires of the community were similar. There was very little difference. It's just numbers that became of people that responded on the online survey is the only in indicator of difference. So what are we dealing with for the, for, for the next uh, three years? And obviously it'll go beyond that, but we stay focused to our three years. We're seeing a growth in population. Uh, hope has stayed relatively on a, on a plane. There is some growth, but it's not uh, to the same level as Chilliwack. However, things are changing. There is always the potential for change. So that is part of one of the things that we are dealing with. Organized crime always is one of the topic points that comes up. Homelessness, and I know that has been a, a touchstone here in Hope, uh, as it is anywhere else in BC or across Canada, probably beyond anywhere, uh, our, our borders. <coughs> Okay, so you can see, uh, again, when we cover off, or in, in traffic concerns, sorry, there's always traffic. It wasn't, oddly enough, it wasn't a highly represented area of concern within the populace, but it was enough for us to, to look at and say, no, we still need to maintain that as a priority for our policing to ensure the safety of the driving public. Anytime you have uh, a, a death on the road, uh, anytime that you have issues that happen on the road, we do take a lot of complaints in regards to traffic, traffic issues that uh, occur within the whole district of Hope area. So we cover, a, a, as I said, a wide swath area, uh, and you can read the list as much as I can, I don't need to go through it. What is the key for us, and what really gets firmly developed is our partnerships that we need to develop. The partnerships that are, exist within this room, and then there's also outside of this with the provincial government, federal government, because we are obviously a federal agency, uh, the health authorities, that becomes very, uh, very much prevalent when you start dealing with the homelessness and vagrancy issues. You'll see that come up as in a, a topic point later on in the slide presentation. The education system, and of course the courts. Um, everybody has their own feelings about the courts, I keep mine to myself, and uh, if you want to read the whole bulletin board by all means, I choose not to read that. I apologize to nobody about that. So, <laughs> so here's uh, the. We had seven questions that we developed for this. Uh, pretty and anyway, the same seven questions are going across the board. There was an online portion that allowed, obviously, for free verse and people to put in their own. There was uh, fill in the, or just a, a tick box in some cases where you could just hit a particular topic. But there was a free first portion where people could put in their own ideas and their own thoughts. It wasn't limited to just, okay, here are the things that we've selected on your behalf to identify as what's important. Of course, we go with the biggest, uh, the biggest topic items that uh, generally we see uh, in the public and what the general public is looking at. But it allowed for uh, a variety of different answers from the public, whatever they felt that was necessary or what was important to them. Because it was an individual exercise at the time, yes, we made it a group exercise in the end when we sp spit out the data, but it was an individual exercise. So, what was the number one issue? And again, this was across the board, this wasn't specific to any community, it was visibility. People want to see us. Completely understandable. So, we need to look at that. That comes up as an answer. Uh, people said that we have good service. So, it kind of a pat on the back for us, we'll accept that, that's, a very, that's very gracious. But what could we do better? Once again, it got to visibility. We want to see our police officers out there interacting with the community, not just in a car driving around, not just uh, responding to calls for service, but being part of the community in different facets above and beyond just call response. So, what could we do to make a positive difference? 
touching in with visibility is be accessible. So they want us to be a part of the community where they can interact with us. And it's not just an interaction based on a phone call or a complaint that comes in for, it's very specific, it is beyond that. So that's what we uh, we read into or what we've seen, I shouldn't say read into, what we've seen and what came from the community. And I engage with the community, again, part of the accessibility, but part of the process is not just merely, again, uh, call response, but being part of the community above and beyond doing policing functions. I think, not think, people know what it is that we do. That's not the core issue. What they want to see is that we interact, that we are part of the community, not merely just people driving around in a car dealing with it, the issue of the day or the issue of the moment. The issues are going to be there, and that, again, that will come up. So what can we work on together? Again, it gets to community. <coughs> community is the theme that we picked up on the responses that we received, especially at events. Now, I, that comes not just from Remembrance Day. I know that we've seen the community of Remembrance Day is always a big one for us and touched some of our hearts. But Canada Day, anything, you know, the uh, brigade days, anything that within the community uh, where there's, a, there's something that's going on and they seek they would like to see us there, to engage, above and beyond policing, because people have a lot of interest, a lot of discussions, uh, and we've had them, but could we do better? Absolutely, and the public has identified that. One of the ones, and this is, uh, and I apologize for, I may not be the oldest in the room, but I'm old, social media is a changing dynamic in the RCMP. It is a changing dynamic for policing all told. We need to do better. That is not something that we're good at. There are internal issues that we need to overcome, barriers that we need to overcome to be better at it, because people want things quicker. They're getting used to things coming quicker. So we need to catch up and raise our bar to meet that level. Now, there are things, again, internally that we have to deal with and overcome. Is it something that we can do? Absolutely. But Again, it was identified by the public. Everybody craves information. So, and they want the information quick. They might want it in 15 second snippets, but neither here nor there, they just, they, they crave information. So we need to do better in communicating that through these methods. Uh, and that's not the whole bullet in the book. I want to clear that up immediately. <laughs> Uh, so again, connect and communicate with the community. When people are looking, okay, uh, what does the public want us to keep in mind with our strategic planning? So you can see out of those answers, community, visibility, and accessibility were the common traits that they were looking for out of the police service that was here. This is very specific to Hope and Boston Bar. Now, there wasn't a lot of people who responded out of Boston Bar, but the answers, again, were all the same. So these are overwhelming with what came up as the primary topic points to the end, or the answers to the questions that were provided. So I think, you know, I don't need to be hit over the head with a frozen snowshoe to understand that we need to do better in the public eye and be out there. So that's one of, uh, one of our guarding principles. So. Public safety priorities. Of course, now we got to get to the actual policing aspect of what it is that we do. It is in our name, police. So, property crime. Property crime is uh, and has traditionally always been a high-ranking issue within the minds of the public. Understandably, because it generally involves uh, personal property, homes, businesses, and people are you know that that really strikes close to home, and it is a very uh, is one of those instances that if you've ever been involved in that, you understand internally how you feel when some, somebody invades your private space. So that, you, we understand why it is that it is such a, a high, that came out as probably the number one issue for the public. And again, clear across the board. Again, police presence and visibility. Again, when we touch on that topic is, and I, Keep going back to it, but that's what the public has identified. Response time. I think we do very good. Uh, can we do better? Absolutely. When you look at the numbers that are there, can we do better? Absolutely. 
drugs. Drugs that are an issue. Let's not get into the whole cannabis thing. That's a new uh, area for us as much as it is for the public. I don't think we've seen the end of what it is in regards to the legalization of cannabis. There are off, offshoots from that that are going to cause issues. But <coughs> that to be said, that's a changing environment to what I started 28 years ago, what it is today. But there is more than just uh, cannabis. There's a number of other drug issues. Uh, and then homeless and vagrancy. I know that this has been a topic point since I've been here for three and a half years. Uh, it's not going to go away. It is part of the public. Uh, what we are looking at from a hope perspective, if I can dare speak just for hope, uh, we are in the launching stage of a situation table that hopefully, no pun intended, will see positive results when dealing with the homelessness and vagrancy issue. We identify the people that need the help and then get them the help that is required from the particular agency that is in the best position to provide that assistance. That may be police. That usually not obviously involves court and jail. It may be mental health. It may be a number of different agencies, but it's agencies getting together, identifying the individuals, and then providing, developing, or developing a strategy that will put them in the best case, best chance of success. So that we start mitigating or elim we'll never eliminate it, but at least tamping down some of the homeless and vacancy issues. I know there's a number of things that are going on within the community that will be uh, going on in, in days and months to come. And that's something that we'll have to adapt to as well because the community has its own plan as to what it is that it's going to do and we have to work in with the community as part of the community partner. So big fancy slide, lots of words. I'm not going to bore you to details. We, uh, we came up with three, three primary topic points. We have, as you know, we have the, uh, we're federal. Uh, the RCMP as a federal agency has its own uh, strategic priorities. Then it goes down to the provincial level. So E Division, which is British Columbia, has their identified priorities. We have to keep that in mind when we are forming our strategic priorities, because that's, we fall under that. There, that's not escapable for us. However, when we looked at, again, the answers provided by the general public, it's amazing how they fell in line with what it is that BC, through a division as a whole, we're looking at. We structured it to more localized, as it should be, and then it came to three topic points, and those are the dark blue bubbles. So, enhanced community safety, very broad-based topic. Uh, of course, it's broken down into three different subgroups. Uh, focus on partnerships and community engagement. Again, a very uh, important aspect of policing. We can't do this alone. Uh, mental health can't do it alone. None of, no agency can do it alone. We have to work together. And we need to do better at working together or enhance the relationships that we've already developed and make them better. And then promoting organizational uh, excellence and supporting our people. Any, any organization looks the same way. You've got to make sure that your people are... Uh, treated well, that they're given the proper tools to do the job to the best of their ability. So in our case, if we give them the tools, that is going to translate into a, a more professional and a better product that's going to be out on the road providing community safety. So we have to look internally as well with the long-term goal, of course, of identifying that this is going to be a benefit to the ex our external partners, our, the community. So, we break it down to priority one, enhance community safety. So, prevent and reduce crime. That's, of course, one of our objectives. If we didn't go into this thinking that wasn't an objective, then we've missed the mark entirely. Of course, we want to see our uh, call volume go down, uh, our property crime rates, all those things we'd like to see on a negative trajectory. Uh, that's, that's what it is that we do. And we need to plan on how to do that overall taking in all our partnerships and everything that it is that we have available and what it is that we can use to make that happen. Number two, no shock, visibility. It was, as you could tell, uh, sorry, I just went back, sorry. Um, as you saw from the questions that the general public answered, 
the overwhelming response had to do with visibility and accessibility. Uh, so if we didn't include visibility in our operating mandate, it would have been a miss, because this is what the community wanted. So we need to increase our visibility. Not the car going down the street. This is the uh, sitting in a, going into businesses, sitting in a coffee shop and talking to the general public. Why coffee? Well, I do like coffee, I'll be honest. So, uh, but it, having those conversations, because we can't do beer. I'll be honest. Just, so. You can, but yes. <laughs> and then enhancing resource efficiency in this day and age. And I, you know, you're having a meeting that's going to deal with budgets. Well, if we're not doing the best of our ability to, to ensure that you're getting the best product from us in the most efficient way possible, so that the citizens of Hope are not being uh, asked to pay more. We have to look internally to see how it is it that we can do better. What is the, where is it that we can save? We're all looking for efficiencies. There isn't an agency that isn't. So we, again, we would be somewhat remiss if we didn't look in our own internal structure and figure out, okay, how is it that we can do things more efficiently? Which sometimes translates into a cost savings or uh, expanded service. So we have outcomes. Uh, we want to reduce property crime. 5% doesn't seem like a large number, but when, when, uh, when you see the property crime rates, we want to see, we want to get to a manageable uh, number that, and it's achievable because we have to look at the community and our people as well and overall. But we want to reduce property crime by 5%. Uh, we want to get to places quicker, the response time. If someone calls for service, barring a 911 where somebody is in uh, trouble, those are our priorities. If somebody, if it's a personal issue where it, uh, an actual person is at risk, that becomes a priority. Obviously, a business or something takes a back seat. It's not, it's unfortunate that may have to happen, but I think people would understand that we need to take care of, of people first and then worry about property sector. We like to reduce the, the calls for service in our hotspots. I don't think anybody in this room would be shocked if we, if I said Memorial Park, so in the downtown core. That's we've seen a, a obviously a drop. I've seen a substantial drop over the winter months. Obviously, our new uh, our new uh, extreme weather and the shelter that's over on well, my neighbors. Uh, they have increased the call for service in the area, but that was an expected change, because or an expected uptick, because it was a change to the local area. So it was something new that was introduced. Of course, we've seen a vast drop in calls for service out of the Thunderbird. So you kind of you, you take the, you know what's coming, and then you plan for it. But we need to look at our hotspot areas and see how we can do a, uh, a better, more efficient job in those areas. And then Motor Vehicle Act. Doesn't necessarily mean that it's all going to be charges. Charges are just we're we're not out there to focus on doing tickets. The ticket revenue goes to the province. It's not that's not what we're about, and that's not what I'm about in dealing with the, uh, the members in the Hope CPO. Uh, if somebody is, and we do have repeat offenders because we track this, and if somebody doesn't want to play within the rules and continually uh, flaunts the rules, school zone. Uh, enforcement is is a touchstone for me. Uh, if we're not protecting the kids, and I think that would be a, an expectation of the public. So we look at motor vehicle line. That again makes our roads safe. It's a it's a safety issue. Okay, right, partnerships and community engagement. Okay, we need to work with our partners for community safety. I mentioned the situation table. Uh, that is one of those ideas that formulated in regards to working with our partners on developing strategies that are going to mitigate some of the issues that are within, or the safety issues that are within the community. We can't do it alone. I, I've been, I don't want to say I've been pounding that desk, but you know, I, I've said since I've been here that we have obviously responsibility and we're involved in the homelessness issue, but it's not a policing issue. I get called for service, no, 
on me, but the members in the office get called for service to do a homeless and vagrancy issues. That has obviously, I, I, I can deal with the surface end of it, but the underlying issues, and I think everybody in the room understands that. So uh, that's why we have to work with our partners, because we can't solve this one on our own. Uh, I'm not that smart. Uh, our Indigenous policing uh, partnerships. We have, uh, we have a number <coughs> of, of police or uh, First Nations uh, reserves in the area. Uh, we need to enhance our relationship with them uh, to ensure that things are going, uh, that they have a sense that we care, that we're involved in the issues within their culture, within their uh, areas that are important to them. Uh, and then communication and education activities. Some relate that uh, DARE. I'll use DARE as an example for hope. Uh, I have now trained, not me, somebody that's much better at it than I, uh, to be a DARE officer and is now in the local schools. So uh, it is that sort of education opportunity that we take advantage of so that we see that as a positive that's going to pay out, maybe not today, we won't see that effect for today, but we'll see it tomorrow, we'll see it five years from now. And by getting in on it at this stage in time, and if any of you have ever been part of the DARE program, uh, sure didn't exist when I was a kid, so I don't even know what it was like when I, when I was a kid. But it's that sort of education opportunity we take advantage of that we can see a benefit uh, to the community at large, <coughs> not only today, but obviously paying it for it. It's important. Uh, again, I, the, uh, the gold box is what we're looking at our engagement outcomes, uh, what it is that we want to do. Uh, we want of course, the fourth bullet sounds a little ominous when you say increased reporting of violence in relationships by 3% a year, meaning we want more calls for service. Seems kind of odd, but the reason that's there is that we're not getting those calls for service. There are people out there in uh, relationships that are not contacting the police and are living a personal hell on a, and I, excuse the language, on a day in and day out basis. And when they're not contacting us, there's very little that we're able to do and <coughs> engage with them to provide them that safety and protect and get them to a location or into a, a, a safe a safe life beyond where it is now. So that's why we have an increase. Because we're seeing what we've seen is generally somebody goes through eight is it eight to fifteen, sir? Somewhere in there, eight to fifteen calls for service or incidents that happen in their lives before a police server notified. So that's why we're saying an increase. It seems at odds, but that's why we want to see the increase. Because by the time you get to that 8th or 15th call, things have really gone uh, terrible. So uh, counterintuitive to say we want an increase, but that's the reason for the increase. Uh, again, uh, we want to, uh, when you deal with mental health apprehensions, again, that deals working with partnerships. For us, it's really important here in Hope uh, that we have a reduction to the best as uh, we can. Obviously, we're not in control of the whole thing, but the closest uh, mental health facility that we have is Chilliwack. So if an officer from here has to go to Chilliwack, which inevitably, they, invariably, they have to do, dependent on the patient to deal with, well, that has repercussion effects to the community. So uh, to see a drop in that, means that there's not an officer that now has to go to the hospital, wait for a doctor to see the, uh, the patient, and then be able to come back. And when you're dealing with a 40 minute trip on either end, that's 90 minutes just for driving, and the average wait time in the hospital is, I don't even want to tell you that, because if you've been in a hospital, you already know, we actually get in quicker than what the most public is, but we're still looking at an expanded wait time for us. So the repercussion, again, for the local community is such that an officer that's paid to do policing work here, but because of a call for service has to, and because of the needs with of the medical community, we have had to go outside the area, uh, that has obviously a trickle down effect. So, we would like to see that number reduced. Thank you. Then dealing with our own people, uh, of course, member wellness, you got a happy and engaged Individual, again, it's the same as any company. We, we didn't write the book on this. You know, this is something we, uh, we can steal and plagiarize from many other corporations. 
How could you engage people, show up for work, and do the best job that they possibly can? We've got to give them the right tools on how to do the job. And in this day and age, a lot of it has to do with uh, electronic uh, computers and all that. Uh, so we have to be able to give them the right tools and teach them how to use the tools. Develop leaders, future leaders in our organization. Uh, we, have, we do a pretty good job, but we can do better. And by doing that, we, we look to other agencies, people to, and outside of policing to develop our future leaders. So again, this is for us to develop ourselves internally so that the product that we provide the members that are there are providing the best service possible to the community. Because they have achieved, or they've uh, been provided with the tools and the training that's necessary to be able to go out there and do that. Excuse me. Mental health, that is a big issue for us. It continues to be. PTSD is, I'm sure everybody knows the acronym, and you've heard it before. It is never was talked about when I first started in 28 years ago, and I dare say, when Superintendent Mass, who come from same, the same era, probably can reiterate that that wasn't, uh, it was put up put up and shut up, or, you know, uh, stop being a princess, get back to work. And I don't want to offend princesses, but that's, that's kind of the language that we were using back in the day. And we, you know, it's like your boss would say, hey, go to the bar, have a couple of drinks, go home. We'll see you at work tomorrow. No matter, you know, you, you've just seen the worst of the worst, and that, that was kind of the response. So we, we obviously have to do better, because we pay, in a, we pay a price for not taking care of our people. These are the people that are unable to show up for work. And that, obviously, is it with any industry. With us, obviously, it becomes uh, far more uh, of an issue. So we have to take care of ourselves. So that's why this one's in there. But the trickle-down effect, of course, is when we're taking care of ourselves, that means the people are now going to be engaged in showing up for work and taking care of their community. This is where this one is very important for us. So, that's our strategic plan. Months and months in the works. We boiled it down to, look, 10 slides. Nine if you exclude the front one with the RCT crest. Uh, so, there is obviously a far more in-depth report on this, but uh, for those that are going to ever want to read it, uh, we put a lot of time and effort in this, and it's important because it is... So Robert Peel, from many a, many a century ago, is the one who came up with uh, the treatise on policing, and first and foremost was we work with the community, we're part of the community, we work for the community. So, it's a very simplified way. He's far better in English than I am, but that's the reason for the strategic plan, so that we reach out to the community. The community is to get engaged. We want it. We solicit their engagement, the good, the bad. We, you know, we know that there's things that we do well, but we know that there's things we can improve upon. We need to hear that from the community. The community has to have that ability to utilize their voice to tell us, hey, this is where you can do better. Visibility, accessibility, obviously, was a, uh, a huge touchstone. On top of obviously dealing with the, the crime, the actual criminal aspects that are going on within the community, but it was, hey, we want you to be more involved in the community. We want to see that you're out there with us. And so we, we listen. If we don't listen, then there's no sense in doing this exercise. It just becomes uh, a paper exercise and some, somebody gets to spend a lot of time doing a lot of work that has no end. So uh, this is what it is that we've uh, developed. Again, it does have a touchstone to hope. I know that it is UFDRD as a whole, uh, but don't get lost in the fact that these topics were across the board in every community. So it's not changing from hope. You saw the, hot, the slide specific to hope, and uh, that is what I'm responsible for. And I'm responsible to Superintendent Massey to say that this is what we're doing within HOPE that meets the needs and the requests of the community. So if there's any questions, let's find out. Thank you for your presentation, Staff Sergeant. Uh, Council? Thank you for coming. We really appreciate it.
I just have a question that is probably an ignorant one on my part. Does each police officer have a secretary or receptionist at the office so they can, they, she can help them write up the reports, or does the police officer have to write up his or her own reports, or can he just dictate it and she writes it up and then he can be out on the field more? I'm, I'm just asking. I don't know. I don't know. No. Thank you for that, and I love your utopian vision, <laughs> but we do have, not for each individual officer, uh, we do have uh, administrative assistants in the office that do a large uh, portion of our administrative work. Any statement that is taken, they transcribe, uh, but there is a verification process where the officer has to be involved. And the officer, because it's a first-hand report, ends up doing a lot of the, uh, the reporting themselves because there is a requirement within the court process that they're providing a first person account of what's happened. So anytime you start filtering it, then it becomes a question as to what would happen and uh, to answer the question even more succinctly is if I give a person to type up the report, I now have to review the, review the report for accuracy. So uh, whether that would be a labor saving or time saving, I'm not sure. Uh, but because of the necessities within the courts and first-person accounts that we have to provide, um, it, it kind of negates the fact that we're able to utilize something along those lines. But we do utilize in circumstances like statements where they are very lengthy, uh, in some cases hours, where somebody else is doing the transcription. However, part of the verification process now is the person that took the statement is now have to review all the work to ensure that every I is dotted and T is crossed. So, it is a very uh, time time process, time involved process that cannot be escaped, and that's primarily to do with the court system. But a good question. I I wish, I truly wish. But call that the Dems Digital Evidence Management System. Yes. Um, if if uh, the worship uh, as the, the question kind of segues into a, a project that that uh, the Upper Ferns and Valley Regional Attachment is going to be a, have a pilot project on, which essentially what that means is that we're going to be given a, uh, some software and the ability to try something new and exciting, and it's not going to cost us anything. So it's called Digital Evidence Management System, and essentially what it is is every officer will be given a smartphone, and will have an app on that smartphone, and when they get to a scene, and if you were a victim, we would take a statement from you, you would dictate your statement, I would ask you questions, and then we would get that. And we're still out in the field, we would download that statement to an electronic transcription, and where it would transcribe it, and it would send it back to the, uh, the police office. So when Carl or one of his team get there, then they would just have to prove that, and put it on the file. And the same thing would be for pictures, for photographs, for, for different crime scenes and that sort of thing. And uh, again, it's the Abbotsford Police Department has been using it for the last eight months. And uh, on, on again, from the municipal end of things, there is a pilot project. And uh, so they came out to do an assessment. They just said, if you don't want to talk to you guys, because you know you're going to take this away from us. So we're not going to tell you anything. <laughs> they, they really like it. It's working well for them. And so again, uh, through, the, through the province, we get to be the RCMP guinea pig for it and push it out. So we'll be come this, this uh, late summer, this fall, we're hoping that uh, it'll all be in place and then we'll, we'll start using it. And we'll see just as to exactly what you're referencing, just as to, you know, it does kind of give you that, that person Friday there that okay, is transcribing that sort of thing. So like, who has an Apple Watch in the room here? And if you have an Apple Watch and it's hooked up to your text messaging or whatever, you can just hit it, and it just boggles my mind just as to how accurate it picks up the transcription. Wow. And it, it's, it's vastly improved over the, wow. over the years. So and the technology is supposed to be the same. So. Thanks, sir. Councillor yeah. Smith. Okay. So for interacting with the town here because of our chainsaw gardens, uh, this year we were putting a chainsaw carving at the RCMP station. It was asked for many years. <laughs> and then Carmel? <laughs> and, and so uh, it'll interact with everything else we have in town because uh, in Leavenworth, Washington, that's what they've done down there. And people come back and say, well, that was kind of neat. They included the local police department. Well, that way, this ours would be involved with us through the fact of the same arc that we're going that will be in front of there. And part of our arc show will be the RCMP station will have something there. So we're proud of that. Council will be doing that this year.
I'll be open red surge again this year. <coughs> For those that got used to me last year or got tired of me last year, um, I'll, I'll give you a, just as a, and it's a, not really an in-house thing. Uh, so last summer, I, I didn't get out as much as I wanted to, but even in the limited time that I was out there, uh, I met people from, because I asked where they're from. So just so you're aware, and I don't know if anybody else tracks this, so this is just my little system that I do, my little idiot system I'm with by asking. <coughs> people from 31 countries are in hope. I don't think I caught everybody, because I'm not sure everybody understood the question that I asked, <laughs> but there were 30 people from 31 countries come, that came through Hope last summer. That, I thought that was a, a rather large, substantial number when you think of Hope. So you know, that, uh, that speaks well, and hopefully we're able to put, again, no pun intended, we would put a positive spin on the community so people would come back here. If it's just something as simple as me asking a question and being out in a Red search to be. I saw him a postcard now. My family had a great big laugh at that. Um, <laughs> but, uh, that could be said. I, I thought that again was the uh, it speaks well to hope in my mind that that many people because it's not me as a drawing card. It's hope as uh, we're coming through this community. I get the last word as usual. Uh, thank you again, Staff Sergeant Redder. I, I have a personal note. I appreciate your involvement in the community. We're on several committees together. <coughs> And we're all there for the same reason, to help make our community a better place to live and work. And I, I appreciate the extra time you put in on all those committees. <coughs> Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Mayor. One of the things uh, that I have a concern about is um, there seems to be a lack of um, the initiative to build cases. Um, and I've seen it from some of your members. And I don't know whether it's a directive from up above, but um, when you go out to a scene and uh, they don't want to take fingerprints and they don't want to uh, take on information that could help them in the future and also how much communication do you have with other uh, detachments in the area to see whether the same scenario is going on in their community? Thank you. Uh, one, it speaks to supervision, part of it. Uh, every case is on a, its own basis. Uh, we should never say no to information. Whether the information is going to help us solve the crime or it's going to be useful for that particular uh, that crime that you're investigating, don't know. I always look at it as Legos. We always have uh, we always build things with Lego. We build a house by Lego, one block at a time. Uh, that's how we I look at uh, investigations. Uh, Anything forensic-wise, that's the officer at the time, is going to make that determination based on their knowledge and their skills and abilities as to whether or not it's going to be successful to have somebody come take prints based on a variety of issues, a variety of factors. Uh, do we look at other or talk to other police agencies all the time? That, that is a constant that goes on. We're ingrained with a number of different uh, committees, groups within the Lower Mainland that include our municipal partners, the other deta uh, RCMP detachments uh, that uh, share information uh, on criminality so that we can determine, okay, what are the trends, what's moving through here, what's not moving through here, is it going to affect us, does it not affect us, a number, obviously a number of issues. We do look on a provincial level as well. We have our Arctic program that uh, provides information from across the division to say, okay, if there's an issue that's happening in Kamloops, what, could it have a translation or can it happen here? So we are filled with information or provided with information from a number of different, not only uh, police agencies, but external agencies as well. So it, it all goes into that, into that bank that we can draw from that's going to help us uh, do our job better. Thank you for your response, but we're going to move on. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Maybe if any more questions, we can help you maybe at the end of the meeting yep. or get back to you on. Thank you. Into staff reports next, please. Uh, Turn over Mr. Fogolowski. <coughs> Mr. Mayor, Council, good evening. Uh, this is another uh, report that ideally will be annual and addresses uh, the community's goal to optimize asset management and address the infrastructure deficit this community, like many other communities, has. So uh, I'll pass over to my colleague, Mr. Dickman. Uh, Mr. Mayor, Council. So the purpose of my report tonight is to seek Council support for application to the upcoming intake. 
of the Asset Management Planning Program. That was a 50-50 matching grant uh, provided by the Ministry of Municipal Affairs and Housing and it's administered by UBCM. So the district has had uh, recent success with this uh, grant program uh, in 2015 to create our Asset Management Plan, in 2017 to do a risk and criticality analysis of our utilities, and in 2018 uh, towards the Water Master Plan. So, um, as Mr. Portolosky alluded to, the rationale for, for applying for this grant is to improve upon our existing uh, asset management plan, which was finalized in 2016, and we uh, intend to do this through the creation of a sewer master plan. So, within the report, there is a recommendation for your consideration. If you have any questions, I'd be happy to answer them. Okay, uh, through you. Uh, when I was reading through this, it said you're going to use true consulting again? To do this, uh, to create the sewer master plan, yes. Uh, should we not do an RFP or do we know they're going to treat us uh, accurately with funding and costs and all that? Uh, if you vote, are we given to them? So back in uh, 2017, in the spring of 2017, uh, staff sought to establish a relationship with an engineering firm that would be ongoing on an as and when uh, basis. Uh, the reason being is that when you continually shift from one firm to another, they never really get a good handle on the infrastructure within Hope, and, and they're not as well positioned to provide you with sound advice because of that lack of understanding. So previous to bringing True on as our contract engineer, uh, the district was uh, going out to RFP for every project, and uh, from my experience uh, in local government, uh, you're far better off to have uh, a contract engineer that you can use uh, repeatedly that does gain that understanding of the community and provide you with better advice. My only concern, I mean, I like that idea of having one engineering company, uh, but I'm just wondering, what are the costs? Are they billing us by the hour, or are they billing us on a contract basis? Or how are they billing us, and how do we know that's fair? So for general engineering, so what we did in 2017 is we put out an expression of interest, mm -hmm. and we had a number of firms respond, I, I believe it was somewhere in the neighborhood of half a dozen, uh, and they provided us their rates, and True's rates were com competitive with all the other uh, firms that, that put forward a proposal. Um, we uh, selected True based on uh, basically their presentation to us and our, our interview with them and a number of firms and we felt that True was the best fit for this community. Uh, I had had previous experience with them and I was quite happy with them. So we did do uh, uh, a verification on their rates at that time and I feel that their rates continue to be competitive with other uh, firms in the industry. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, my question is just: Does the does the sewer master plan also include uh, storm water? The, the intent is to do a storm water master plan in 2020. Okay. Yes. Thanks. Thank you, Mr. Dickens. So, the council support the District of Hope application to the 2019. UBCM Asset Management Planning Program for a grant money in the amount of $15,000 to advance the district's asset management planning through the creation of a sewer master plan and the council commit the district to provide overall grant management. Move, second, all those in favor, opposed, you carry. Your second report, please. Mr. Mayor, Council, this is largely an administrative uh, matter uh, regarding uh, a provincial right of way, which most people won't realize is <coughs> under Copper Lake. So uh, I'll pass to my colleagues here to explain that. It's, it's, it's Mr. Mayor, for you. Uh, so the purpose of this report is to apply to the provincial government for a replacement tenure for an existing right of way which expires on September 27, 2019. And the right of way uh, is over a portion of the bed of Cockwell Lake. So essentially, the it's a pipe that goes between East Cockwell Lake and the main beach boat launch between uh, sewer lift stations, and it conveys all the sewage from <coughs> East Cockwell Lake uh, to the west side, and then eventually through a series of pumping and gravity uh, systems to the uh, treatment center. Um, 
so this is, uh, as Mr. Portolowski alluded to, is uh, if council will recall, last year we had another uh, right-of-way renewal up in Cockwell Lake. Uh, it seems like most of the right-of-ways out there were established uh, at or near the same time. And uh, this is a simple renewal of a, of a right-of-way that is in place uh, that is set to expire. Thank you. Any questions, council? Okay, thank you. The Council of District of Hope endorsed the application to the provincial government for the replacement tenure of right of way number 237194 over the bed of Cockwell Lake, Yale District of the Yale of the Yale Division of the Yale District, shown outlined on plan C13757 for the purpose of the sanitary sewer line, and further that council support a term for more than 30 years. Moved. Second. All those in favor? Those carried. Thank you. There's uh, no committee reports tonight. Here on council report, I have a brief report and then I'll <coughs> move on to Councillor Smith at the end when I'm done. I attended the BC Transit public consultation. Uh, recently, the, the, the same theme came up. There's a need for a midday route. You can get there in the morning, get there in the afternoon. Seniors are having trouble with midday medical appointments, and they seemed uh, uh, concerned about this, and BC Transit was listening. It seemed to be the number one item. That, uh, the ridership is up what, approximately 100 per month. The average is 700. They've gone up to about 800 per space over the year, which is good news. And it was approximately at that time on Wednesday, 200 online surveys have been completed. So the public's responding, and uh, the most of it is uh, positive about the service. Uh, and uh, I'm, I'm sure we will get that midday group they're looking at. We've completed round three of the budget meetings, and uh, I think we're moving forward with a good plan. We'll see you on Thursday. I met with the University of Fraser Valley President, Dr. Joanne McLean. Talked about a, a wide range of topics, including increasing community engagement and broadening the local course selections. Because that's and, uh, she's been doing her job. She came on board in May, May 2018. So she's looking forward to working with our community and uh, seeing what we can do together. On the fun side of my job, the grade five class was here for a Q and A in the in the council chambers. Interesting questions. Uh, broad range of questions, some I think may be prompted by family members, but uh, everything from how much do you make to what do I want to do when I retire from being the mayor. So it was, uh, it was uh, very enjoyable. Uh, the women's hockey tournament, I saw two games there, including the first game and the, the final game. Uh, it's too bad the weather was so good, they were hoping for a bit of rain to bring more people inside, but it was still well attended, and they plan to come back next year already. The organizer talked to me uh, after the game and said, we treated extremely well uh, at all levels, and the community and the facility was great, and they had lots of comments about the good ice. So, as a, and I, I heard that from you as well. From your that keeps me up. That keeps you up. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, the last item is it's volunteer week, so I'd like to take a moment to thank all our community volunteers for their, their uh, generous hours of volunteering. Uh, it's what makes our community the great place to uh, live, work, and play. And there's a volunteer creation event tomorrow from 1 to 4 at Read Right at the Free Rain Building. Uh, there's a, a little appreciation and coffee and cake, and uh, thank you for any volunteers that want to come down. So. Those that do volunteer in our community, you are well appreciated. Councillor Smith. Okay, good. Mine's simple. Uh, yeah, thank you, staff, for those budget meetings that you've gone pretty good. I won't say I won't sleep, but it's done very well. So, uh, another, I had a, one of my colleagues that I work with called Public Works, called front office, called Public Works, and had some trees dealt with on the street and with in a ridiculously timely manner. So, he wants to say thank you very much. John took care of it very well and was done with it hours so he was very happy to uh, do that so um, other than that I have nothing else to report. Thank you. We'll go down to Councillor Tronic please. Yeah I just actually echo what the, both of you kind of said but I'm pretty happy with how the budget begins going as well and like Peter I attended uh, I think yeah, I'm sure it was the final of the South Coast Women's Hockey League and I was talking with one of the 
He was one of the members of the two teams that was playing in the finals. And he just echoed, yeah, yeah like, uh, ice was great. Um, great location for all the teams. Um, in fact, his team that actually won didn't let a goal in all weekend, so I guess he was doing his job quite well. <laughs> and that, uh, yeah, we'll go to tournament again next year. So, yeah, all parties were quite satisfied. That's your student. Um, okay, thank you. Uh, Purple Lights Committee has set it up, and for anyone who doesn't know what Purple Lights is, it's um, a committee that brings awareness to domestic violence, and uh, it's around the month of October, and their, their goal is to get the message out that you don't have to suffer in silence. Uh, so they've chosen their theme for this year, and the theme is I Have a Voice. And in the past, they've chosen things like love and respect. And they've done coloring pages around those topics and getting the kids involved, getting organizations involved. So um, this year, it'll again be on October the 1st. Um, this committee meeting that we went to, we reviewed last year and the events that took place. We did a, a hot dog fundraiser at Vital Foods and Simon Foods. Um, as well as the Maple Battalion story was told in our schools. Now, anyone uh, who doesn't know the story, it's about a relationship um, where violence took place and um, unfortunately someone's life was lost. But the message needs to get out to um, our youth and people who are just starting out in relationships. What, a, what is a healthy relationship and how do I know if it's healthy? And if I'm a friend of someone who's in an unhealthy relationship, how do, I just, how do I address that? How do I bring that up in a conversation with them? So um, this year again, uh, the focus will be on, on giving people their voice and letting them know that they speak up, just as we heard with the RCMP earlier, um, increase the number of people who report. Um, so I'll keep you posted as to how that's progressing. Um, also attended budget meetings and the transit um, consultation at the rec center. And I attended the, another community action committee um, where we had the regional director show up. This is at the mental health, um, regarding mental health in our community. And the attendees at the meeting are basically people who have lived experience. So they're talking about what are some of the challenges they face in accessing care in our community? Um, so one of the things they pointed out is that uh, in Chilliwack, the former mayor was really, really instrumental in helping them <coughs> chime on about how they needed certain services. And because of her, her relentlessness, they were able to get services. So if you guys want to chime in, one of the services we need in Hope is an outreach worker. So if you have the ear of someone who can make that happen, just outreach worker in Hope Mental Health. And just keep going until we get what we need in this community. There are over 200 people serviced in our mental health facility in Hope, three nurses, and one support worker. It is not enough. And we need to chime in and make sure that Hope gets the services it needs. They say that the, the lady reported out that in um, the Fraser Health System, it seems that the money trickles down, trickles down, trickles down until it gets to hope, and then we get what's left. So we need to be a, a strong voice and ensure that the people of this community get the services that they require. And I said I'd do that, so I hope you heard me. <laughs> All right, got that one? Um, okay, so... Oh, I also attended the Fraser Health Hospital Foundation's presentation on wills, estates, and gift planning after death. And that was enlightening. So I have a huge package. If anyone is planning in those directions, please. Are you planning? You gotta plan. Because here's the thing. Here's the thing. When you plan, you can actually create an estate where less tax needs to get paid if you do it. Uh, methodically. And did you know that if you give a gift of a uh, stock or an investment to a charity, that actually becomes a tax deduction to your estate. But if you um, take the, the estate and then write a check to that charity afterwards, now it becomes um, part of your capital gain. So you want to make sure that if you plan to be charitable in your death, 
that you do it beforehand and get the deduction. It is very informative. <laughs> Sounds like it. <laughs> and uh, that would be everything I have to report. Thank you so much. Thank you, Councillor Stewart. We were, we've been told. <laughs> yes, you are. <laughs> okay, thank you. Um, I attended uh, the whole great fairs, and it was really interesting that Lego meet that they had a couple weeks ago brought in, they were able to donate about $3,000 to community, uh, back to the communities. Uh, I think what is to the senior? Park Street. Park Street, yeah, yeah. 2000 to Park Street. Yeah, and uh, 700 to the Silver Creek uh, Library and Band Program. So that, I mean, it's wonderful. It's a great attendance. And it also meant to the Chamber of Commerce, and uh, we're still working on getting the highway sites redone. It's a slow process, but we're going to try and get it done. That's all I have. Thank you. Where is Councilman? Yes, from my report, I've got the uh, advantage of another board meeting coming up on the 15th. It's sort of a uh, not a normal scheduled board meeting. It's normally they're the fourth Tuesday of the month. Um, but we just, they wanted to have one more in there uh, to finalize things before the AGM, which is on the 26th um, at uh, the conference center. And uh, one topic that came up at the last eventual meeting was um, council liaisons are currently non-voting members, I guess you could say, with the liaisons. But at our last uh, council strategic planning session, when we had our solicitor here, they did mention that um, the rules have kind of changed again. And thought, is it worth looking into to see if Councillor Smith and myself or whoever the appointed liaisons could be voting members again? Just a topic for conversation to see if it's possible. Maybe you know, somebody looking to you know, take or if it's possible. Also, I attended the BC Transit. Uh, one of the things they are looking for is to have the, <coughs> the buses connect with uh, SkyTrain. That is on the drawing boards and that, which would be a great thing. It's, and it's very affordable for people traveling on that. They also stop at Chihuahua and it's uh, Seabird on the way down too, so they've added that to it, some shelves. Uh, also the budget meeting around three. Uh, women's hockey uh, championship game, I went to that, very entertaining. Uh, as Mr. Foralowski would appreciate, I think a uh, you know, goal scored on you in the whole tournament, it feels good for you. <laughs> Anything for charity. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I attended the uh, Shellback plowing match. Uh, <coughs> was, uh, I drove a farm tractor when I was at Bristol when I was just a kid. So it's a 1972 John Deere, which was a new tractor for me. But uh, it was very interesting and a lot of fun. It was very muddy. The boots were about three times the size of it ended in the mud. Uh, library happening. The team at the library is working on it. We're still trying. Uh, by the end of August, we're hoping to have 4,000 people signed up in Hope here with library cards, which is an excellent ratio. Uh, also uh, attended the Beta Community Group meeting, actually about the medical service and health of life, uh, well, living in, uh, healthy living in Hope area with uh, Jordan Christmas, which is really his really name. Uh, Mr. Fordlowski and I met with him and they are talking about needs in the community and that, and uh, after listening to them talk about other places, we're actually doing pretty good and we have a pretty good team in place and I hope you're working towards pretty positive things ahead with some of the areas we're looking at. Uh, community Saloon, we're working on 6th Avenue again tomorrow. We have uh, excavators, fortunately, uh, Mr. Dickens provides us with uh, supplies and that so we can be, you know, safe in the traffic and everything else in the area. And what else was it? Oh, also, you can notice public works is when they put that on the uh, uh, calcium on the road this year, they didn't use as much sand. How clean the streets have come this year, which actually saved us a lot of money at cleaning up over previous years, which also doesn't go down the drains and everything. So just just a <coughs> heads up to people that you know that's what's the idea to try and save us money in the end. So and that's it. All right, thank you for your reports, Council. We're moving into permits and bylaws. Ms. Bellamy, do you want to speak to each one individually or just go through these because they're pretty straightforward? They're pretty straightforward. Yeah. Okay. They're at the top. Yeah. All right, thank you. So, first one is that District of Hope Council Procedure Bylaw number 1447 2019 be adopted this eighth day of April 2019. 
Moved, second, all those in favor, opposed, carry. B, that the District of Hope Official Committee Plan Amendment Bylaw number 1451 2019 to redesignate the property at 5989 500 Peak Road from limited use to country residential be adopted this eighth day of April 2019. Moved and second, all those in favor, opposed, carry. The District of Hope Zoning Amendment Bylaw number 1452 2019 to rezone the property at 5989 500 Creek from a limited use L1 to country residential CR1 be adopted as 8th day of April 2019. Moved, second. All those in favor, carry. Thank you. That the Municipal Ticket Information Bylaw number 1453 2019 be adopted this 8th day of April 2019. Moved, moved. Second, thank you. All those in favor, opposed, carry. The bylaw notice enforcement bylaw number 1454 2019 be adopted this 8th day of April 2019. Moved, second, all those in favor, opposed, carry. Thank you. Mr. Fortolotsky, over to you, please. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, uh, Council. Uh, the report that uh, uh, Mr. Gill is going to talk about, uh, quite frankly, is the result of a lot of great staff work, relationship building, and initiative on behalf of the community to uh, service a need, and that need is multifamily housing that's affordable. This is one of the initiatives that's basically in the hopper now. We have a couple more, but this is uh, uh, now with this concrete step regarding a development permit uh, is really going to become uh, in view as far as the public is concerned, so I'd like to pass it on to my colleague, Mr. Gill. Uh, Your Worship, through you, um, the proposal uh, initially came to Council back in September of 2018. Uh, the applicant successfully rezoned the property from Highway Commercial to RM1 multifamily. The applicant intends to erect a 46-unit multifamily affordable housing complex consisting of a 38 apartment units and 8 townhouse units in the form of uh, two four four plexes. Uh, the anytime uh, someone proposes more than uh, 10 dwelling units, it needs to go through a development permit. Uh, in this case, the development permit that's come before you is the Hope Intensive Residential Development Permit, and basically outlines the sort of uh, the master plan for the site and how it's going to intricate or synchronize within the uh, community and the, and the existing sort of uh, location. Uh, and then also to follow up is the variance permits. Uh, the variances are for, uh, two are for height in regards to the building height. Uh, one is just more of a technical concern in the sense that the highest peach, according to the definition of, uh, of building height, the average height is usually determined by the highest pitch and the highest eave. In the case of the apartment complex, the eaves are high, so it almost comes off as a flat roof and therefore you require a variance to sort of fix that up. Um, the other end is the tip townhomes uh, which have sort of come over uh, on height uh, and of course with even the plans that they have submitted in, um, they're not taken from the actual ground, uh, they're sort of a bit higher up uh, and uh, so we're, we're compensating for that and just in case there's any sort of changes or design changes in stream um, that, that's why we're sort of asking for a little bit more in the height envelope side of things. Uh, the site also has a variance for parking. The number of parking stalls there are 70, unit, 70 stalls. However, uh, the, the stalls that are within the townhomes are not going to be, they're only going to be exclusive for those tenants within those townhomes. They're not going to be open for everybody within that complex itself. And therefore, uh, the variance is for the number of parking stalls for the apartment complex, um, which come out to be about 45 stalls is what they're asking for. Um, they typically would be required 49 stalls. And then the other parking uh, variance permit is in regards to the number of small parking stalls uh, that typically are allowed 15% in, in regards to the zoning bylaw. Uh, However, they're requesting it to be up to the 20.5% small tar parking stalls. Um, there's no actual real concern. When it comes down to affordable housing complexes, uh, 
typically the ratio that most municipalities use is a one-to-one -one ratio for unit to parking stall. In this case, the site's sufficient enough that it's going to be providing maybe more than the parking that's required for the tents within the, uh, the complex itself. And then finally, it's the amenity area uh, site requirement from the RM1 zone. It's typically required 100 meters for an amenity area, uh, 100 square meters, and uh, in this case, the applicant would like to vary that to 79.5 square meters. Um, there is going to be an outdoor amenity area that would sort of compensate <coughs> this. However, because it's more for uh, housing people uh, and, and more buildings are basically uh, looking to create more units, this is why that variance is in place. Thank you for your report. Um, before I move forward, any questions of staff? Councilor Erickson. So, thank you, through you. I just have a couple questions just to straighten my thinking up. Is the apartments going to be for rent or are they going to be strata? Uh, Your Worship, for you, the intention when the rezoning application came before us, it was for rental purposes. Only rental. No sales. Uh, Your Worship, for you, I cannot answer that question. I'm basically facilitating the application for the applicant. That would be a question for them to answer. Okay, and what about for the, the multifamily? Is that strata or is that uh, for, strata for sale or just uh, rental? Uh, your worship through you. Um, once again, this is program housing. It was the intended purpose was for rental. Mm -hmm. um, however, it, it'd be a question for the applicant to sort of find out if in the future if they're going to be considering strata or stratifying it for individual uh, entitlement. So, don't they do the strata as they're doing development permit? Wouldn't they put that in the development permit? Uh, your worship through you, um, it would be a strata plan. However, there's no strata plan that's been submitted to the municipality at this point in time. I don't believe it's going to be a strata because of that. Uh, after the fact, it's a very difficult process to do to bring into a strata title. Uh, strata conversions usually require coming back to council. Well, that's why I was wondering if, if they're applying as a strata or if they're just applying as a rental unit. So it's not a strata. Uh, your worship, do you know it's not a strata as the best I know? Is there a, a visitor parking allowed here or no? Uh, you worship through you, yes, the plan does have visitor parking, but it does not require any sort of variances. And that's, that's why it was sort of left out. Oh, okay. Okay, okay any other questions before I read these, these recommendations? Uh, that a whole intensive residential form of character development permit be approved for a multifamily affordable housing complex on the, on the property. 755 Old Hope Princeton Way, and further that the Director of Community Development be authorized to approve minor changes to the Hope Intensive Residential Form and Character Development Permit, and further that for purposes of the Development Permit validity period, the conditions of the Development Permit shall expire on April 8, 2021, and further that for purposes of any associated building permit, that the substantiality start of any construction shall mean the completion of an approved foundation for any of the proposed structures as certified safe by a qualified profession. Move that recommendation. Moved. Second. All those in favor? Opposed? Carry. Recommendation number two, that in accordance with the District of Hope application procedures and public hearings information bylaw, the Local Government Act and the Community Charter authorized staff to notify area residents informing them that council will be considering the issuance of a development variance permit to vary the multiple family residential RM1 maximum building height provision for townhouses from 10 meters to 11 meters. Vary the multiple family residential RM1 maximum building height provision for apartments from 12 meters to 15 meters. Relax the minimum number of off-street parking spaces for apartments from 1.3 per dwelling to 1.2 per dwelling. Vary the small car parking provision from a maximum of 15% of the number of required off-street parking spaces to 20.5%. And vary the, the multiple family residential RM1 condition of use for a common amenity area from 100 square meters to, to 79.5 square meters. In order to instruct a multifamily affordable housing complex on the property 755 Old Holt Princeton Way. Moved. 
Second. All those in favor? All those carried. Back to you, Mr. Gill. Uh, Your Worship, through you, uh, 66436 Cockrell Lake Road um, currently went through a demolition permit for above the foundation portion. Uh, however, the property owner would like to maintain that foundation for sort of a, a rebuild or a change in the structure's design. Uh, and therefore, because it's located in East Cockrell Lake, it's affected by two development permits related to hazards, uh, one being a flood erosion hazard, the second being a geotechnical hazard. Thank you, Mr. Grimmel. Council, any questions of staff before I move on? Thank you. That a flood and erosion and geotechnical hazard development permit be approved for the property legally described at 66436 Cockrell Lake Road for the construction of a single family dwelling on the exi existing footprint of the original residence and approved accessory structures subject to the District of Hope receiving a satisfactory certified report from a qualified professional confirming site-specific safe building envelopes. And further, the Director of Community Development be authorized to endorse the flooding, erosion, and geotechnical hazard development permit and required covenant document. And further, that for purposes of the development permit validity period, the conditions of the development permit shall expire on April the 8th, 2021. And further, that for the purposes of Section 504 of the Local Government Act, substantially start any construction shall mean the placement of the required geotechnical engineer designed scour protection positioned along the existing foundation. <coughs> Move and second. All those in favor? Those carried. Mr. Gill again, please. Uh, your Worship, through you, uh, once again, this is another property in the East Coppola Lake area affected by the two hazards, the flood erosion and the geotechnical hazard. In this case, the proposal that's come before you is in regards to an addition to an existing building, uh, approximately 950 square feet is how much they want to sort of expand it by, and then also uh, to build a detached garage of about 900 square feet. Questions, Council? Okay. Excuse me, that a flood and erosion and geotechnical hazard development permit be approved for the property 66596 Cockrell Lake Road for an addition to the existing dwelling and the construction of a new detached garage subject to the District of Hope receiving a satisfactory certified report from a qualified professional confirming a site specific safe building envelope and further that the Director of Community Development be authorized to endorse the flood and erosion and geotechnical hazard development permit and required covenant document. And further that for purposes of the development permit, validity period, the conditions of the development permit shall expire on April the 8th, 2021. And further that for the purposes of Section 504 of the Local Government Act, substantially start any construction shall mean the placement of scour protection along the foundation of the existing house and proposed addition. Moved, second. All those in favor? All those carried. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Gell. Moving on to the uh, financial plan that the District of Hope 2019-2023 financial plan bylaw number 1455 2019 be read a first, second, and third time this 8th day of April 2019. Mm -hmm. Moved, second, and question. question. Thank you, through you. Just one question um, on our page 196. It's got a section for the revitalization tax exemption, um, saying that details pertaining to the tax exemption are outlined in the district of tax exemption bylaw. But since that's currently expiring, we haven't brought it up. Should we leave that in there or uh, take it out for now? Or does it not affect anything? It, uh, I would uh, suggest that we leave it in in case council, as part of their planned uh, discussions, are already bringing the revitalization initiative back to council. Ultimately, um, the tax exemption is only uh, allowable if there's a bylaw in place. So this would be null and void if, if in fact, council chose not to put back in place another revitalization tax incentive program. Thank you. Right. We have a motion on the floor. Yeah. You did. Yeah. 
and second. And all those in favor? All those carry. The District of Hope 2019 Annual Tax Rate Bylaw Number 1456 2019 be read at first, second, and third time. This is April 2019. Moved. Second. Any discussion? All those in favor? All those carry. Correspondence. The accounts payable check listing for March 2019 will be received. Moved. Second. All those in favor? Opposed. Carried. The uh, for information correspondence list dated April 8th will be received. Moved. Received. Thank you. All those in favor? Opposed. Carried. At this time, we will entertain any uh, questions from the public for items relevant to the agenda. Answered. Thank you. The next meeting is Tuesday, April the 23rd, right here in the District of Hope Council Chamber. Mr. Mayor, yes, it may be worth uh, publicizing at this time again the public consultation on the budget bylaws, which is happening this Thursday. This Thursday at 6.30. Thank you for the reminder. <coughs> Motion to adjourn. Thank you. Move the second. All those in favor? All those carry. Everybody's paying attention. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs>